Assalamu alaikum and welcome. My name is Kazim Afridi and today I shall tell you the fascinating story of the unknown sultan. Dublin, the capital of the Republic of Ireland. Ireland was colonized by the British for hundreds of years. The people of Ireland have a history of suffering under British colonialism, similar to the suffering in other parts of the world who were ruled by the British in the past, like India under the British Raj. My home in Dublin is close to some important historical sites. St. Patrick's Hospital, which was founded 250 years ago with money left in a will by Jonathan Swift. Swift is the author of the famous story Gulliver's Travels. Swift also wrote a satirical essay called A Modest Proposal, in which he argued that the poor Irish living under British rule should eat their own children. This is the Kilmainham Jail Museum. Many famous Irish leaders were imprisoned, tortured, and executed here by the British. The jail was also used to imprison people for petty thefts. A woman was jailed for stealing a chicken. The British even arrested and jailed children. The youngest boy to be jailed in Kilmainham is said to have been only five years old. Ireland suffered one of its most horrific tragedies in the middle of the 19th century. The Great Famine lasted from 1845 to 1849. It is estimated that more than a million people died during the Potato Famine. Another million emigrated from Ireland to America. Many died during their journey to America and the ships of these emigrants came to be known as coffin ships. At the time of the famine, there was no shortage of food in Ireland as it was only the potato crop that had suffered due to the disease called the potato blight. However, the British continued to export food out of Ireland to sell it for their profits. This fact is well recorded by historians and depicted in the illustrations from that time. John Mitchell was a writer for the Irish newspaper The Nation during the famine years. He described the famine in these words. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. In 2007, whilst preparing a Friday sermon for Muslim doctors in St. James's Hospital, I came across the story of the unknown sultan on the website khilafa.com. I emailed a few people about this unknown event of Irish history. One of them is my friend, Roger Cole. Roger sent my email to Newstalk radio station. They invited me for an interview on the Talking History program with Patrick Gagan. Uh, the Ottoman Sultan was considered the leader of all Muslims. He was the Khalifa. Um, so when he came to know about the Irish famine, he realized this was a big, huge disaster and he wanted to help the Irish people. You see, the Ottoman Sultan wasn't a Turk, he was a Muslim first, and he was a ru ruler and a leader of all Muslims. He represents the Muslim uh, community all over the world, which we all know is called the Ummah. So the Ottoman Sultan ruled over all sorts of Muslims, uh, from Turks to Arabs to huge community of Muslim population. The Sultan came to know about the famine from his personal physician, Neil Fitzgerald, who was from Ireland. 
The Sultan informed the British government that he wanted to donate 10,000 pounds, but Queen Victoria refused to accept this donation because she was donating only 2,000 pounds herself. So the British government made the Sultan reduce the donation to 1,000 pounds. The Sultan was not happy with this, so he secretly sent three to five ships of food to Ireland. The British courts, however, came to know about these ships and they refused docking at both Dublin and Belfast. So the Turkish sailors decided to dock at Drogheda and unloaded all the food there. They stayed at the town hall of Drogheda at that time. The British government has never apologized to the Irish people for what they did during the famine. The colonialist uh, era has been the darkest era of um, uh, mankind and especially for Muslims we've suffered as well because it's ultimately it was the British who even destroyed the Ottoman Caliphate. They conspired against it and they've destroyed it and this is one of their biggest crimes against Muslims. We as Muslims cannot and will not forget that. help to Ireland during the famine. During the famine, America, India, countries like that. <laughs> yeah. do you, what did the British do during the famine? Took the food. Do you know who sent help to Ireland during the famine in the 1800s? Oh, lots of different people sent help to Ireland. One of the most remarkable was an Indian tribe, but I think based somewhere else back well, I know a lot of um, Irish people have over to the States. Yes. Um, so with regards to people's health, I'm not too sure to be honest. Well, what do you think about the British? What did they do during that time? <laughs> do you know what the British did? <laughs> not very nice. They exported food when we needed it. I have not the Irish Of all the people we interviewed about the famine history, no one knew about the Muslim support to Ireland during those years. Next, I decided to check out the history books at my local library. Out of the numerous books I researched, I found only one book that mentions the donation of £1,000 by Sultan Abdul Majid to Ireland, but it does not describe how he was made to reduce that donation by Queen Victoria or the ships of food he sent to Ireland. I also got help from the researchers at the library in Trinity College who scoured historical databases and archives. And I also looked in the National Library but found nothing about this event. The only full account of the events around the donation by the Sultan are in a travelogue written by a Christian missionary named Reverend Henry Christmas. Reverend Christmas described the Sultan in these words. This is the true spirit of Christianity and there is more of it in the Mohammedan Sultan of Turkey than in any or all of the Christian princes of Eastern Europe. An important question can now be asked. Why is it that the Irish people are unaware of this history? They know that a Native American tribe sent aid to Ireland, but no one knows that Muslims sent aid to Ireland as well. Patrick Gagan of News Talk asked me a question about the Armenian Genocide. Now the Turks have always denied that they were involved in a deliberate genocide against the Armenians. In fact, the Turks used to call the Armenians as Millat-e Sadiqa, 
which means the loyal nation. Towards the end of the Caliphate, many people, such as the Young Turks movement, had adopted ideas such as nationalism, which are completely anti-Islamic. Some of these nationalists were involved in crimes against the Armenians during the First World War. When people accuse the Turks of the Armenian genocide, they generally don't mention the fact that the Ottoman courts sentenced 19 Turkish commanders for their role against the Armenians, including Mehmet Talat Pasha. There were numerous Armenians who achieved great status and served in important roles within the Ottoman Caliphate, including the Ottoman military. The proof of Ottoman justice towards non-Muslim minorities, such as the Armenians, can be found in stories such as that of the Ziljian symbol. Um, the story about Ziljian started um, around the 17th century. There was this guy called Avlis. He was from Armenia, and, but he was living in Constantinople. And um, he was an alchemist. He wanted to create gold out of metal base. But instead what he created was a kind of a, a metal sheet like this one. He actually, you know, realized that he had created symbols that had sustain and projection, which were far more better, you know, than the ones that existed at the time. The Ottoman Empire, and especially Osman II, the Sultan, realized about the quality of the symbols, and he actually adopted that symbols into the army. And as well, like, they had some uh, daily prayers, they used the symbols, uh, royal weddings. As well, the Sultan gave him the name Siljan, which actually means son of a symbol maker. Ottoman Janissary Band, the Mehtar, was the first military band in the world. Turkish music has inspired musicians like Beethoven and Mozart. It was time for me to go to Istanbul. There is so much to see in Istanbul. It could easily take months to explore the whole city. When you go to Istanbul, make sure you visit the Panorama 1453 Museum. It has three-dimensional art and audio narrative showing the conquest of Istanbul by Sultan Muhammad Fatih in 857 Hijra. Oh, 
I searched for the resting place of our unknown sultan. A sister from Turkey had told me that he was buried near Yavuz Sultan Salim Mosque in Fateh district of Istanbul. After getting directions, we finally reached Yavuz Sultan Salim Mosque. The mosque was closed to visitors as there was restoration work going on there, but upon request, the Imam allowed us in. Sultan Abdul Majid passed away on Tuesday, 16 Zul Hijjah, 1277 Hijra, due to tuberculosis at the age of 39 years. On the day when I was coming back from Istanbul to Dublin, I read the news that the last surviving member of the Ottoman family from the era of the Caliphate had passed away. Upon my return to Dublin, I had one last thing to do to finish our story. I decided to go to Drogheda and found the place where the Ottoman sailors stayed whilst unloading food aid sent by the Sultan. This was the town hall of Drogheda and it is used as a hotel nowadays. Today, the whole of the Muslim world suffers under oppressive and tyrannical regimes. But there is cause for hope, for our master Muhammad Wasallam prophesies that the Caliphate will return once again upon the method and mercy of prophethood. So let us pray and rejoice and never forget the legacy of the noble Ottomans. Assalamu alaikum. Resul-i Enbiya, Peygamberimiz Cenab-ı Ahmed-i Mahmud-u Muhammed Mustafa, Ali evlad Resul-i Müşteba-i imdad-ı ruhaniyetine, bir cümle alemi İslam'ın sıhhat-ü selametine, devletimizin